welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator, uh, creator of the RPG edition of the Mystery Flesh Pit. Yes, this is a real thing, stop asking him about it. <laughs> and, and 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 diving straight into the weird and wonderful world of the cipher system through this, the one and only Christopher Robin Negalin, aka Gan aka Ganza Gaming. Um, no Winnie the Pooh jokes. We've heard them all. How are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm not doing too bad. How are you, man? I'm doing good. It is a little bit too sunny up there for my taste, but it's Minnesota weather, so. I'm pretty sure the stick is going to happen tomorrow because that's how this works. I have very cold memories of Minnesota. As you should. <laughs> if you don't like the weather around here, wait 10 minutes. It'll change. I, and we're, I'm originally from Oklahoma, so yes, I'm very much the Midwest mindset. We just have to mm -hmm. wait 10 minutes. It'll get better or worse, but it won't be what, you're, what it is now. Mm -hmm. So... A bit of a tradition for around here is the origin story. So I'd like to get I'd like to get into how how you first got introduced to role playing games and what about it made it stick. Um, I'll try to keep it on the shorter end, but I was in the Boy Scouts on uh, one of those uh, you know events that take a couple of weeks to do, and I heard some people talking about uh, flaming swords and orcs. And, you know, through the couple of years before that, uh, in our family library, I'd already found Jules Verne, uh, Tolkien, uh, among other fantasy and science fiction greats. So I was like, what is this about? And I mean, even the next day, I was already drawing my own uh, cavern dungeon system and going, hey, hey, hey. So I guess I should have decided if I didn't want to be a forever GM, I should slow down on making the maps and stuff. Uh, and then uh, in high school, I did it all through high school. It was like I had some friends, and one weekend we would be gaming almost the whole literal weekend, and then the next weekend we'd take off and do it again. And it was basic and and X expert. Mm -hmm. And then it was uh, it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and it was Gamma World. And then by college, I got into GURPS because Car Wars was a, a thing I was into back then. So I wanted to do the role-playing game for Car Wars. Mm -hmm. And then I was big into GURPS until it happened to do Storyteller. And then it just kept kind of snowballing from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but can it stick? I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, it was hanging out with my friends doing that was kind of my version of a safe space. Mm-hmm. Because I was just a little different than everybody else, especially in a small town where I would want to talk about science and science fiction and fantasy and Star Wars, and everybody else was wanting to talk more about baseball or football. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a, for me it's a case of of the of my group ended up talking about both, even though a lot of it was dealing with the pain of be of being a fan of sports in Minnesota. <laughs> Well, for a long time, I was stuck in the mindset of there had to be the geeks and the brains and there had to be the jocks. And my life was much easier when I was like, hey, you know what? We should just let people geek out about whatever it is that they're geeking out and and not judge. The jocks weren't too weren't too fond of me because I kept because I kept pulling shit to annoy them. Um, chief among them was getting somebody to change all the locks in the lockers while everybody was at practice. <laughs> uh or put or um, finding someone's cat finding someone's um, catcher's mitt and putting Vaseline in it. You were just looking for trouble, weren't you? Yes, I didn't, I was that kid who I don't want peace, I want problems. <laughs> oh. But I f I fig I figured th that um if I if I do the whole try and defend myself and f and fight back then I'm going to get in trouble and it's a case of yeah, I can't. I can't, um, I can't beat the system, but I can break it. <laughs> but 
how did you first come across the the art project that is the mystery flesh pit? Um, well, I was uh, kind of going through YouTube, and I think it's called the Curious Archive, which they kind of focus on books and TV shows that do speculate speculative evolution and kind of do a documentary. Uh, what if this was real sort mm -hmm. of thing, which is kind of one level over the mystery flesh pit, because that's how it is presented as kind of a documentarian style sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, this is crazy. This is awesome. And I found the actual legit mystery flesh pit and was a fan of going down those rabbit holes. Uh, at the same time, it was two or three months out before uh, Cyph uh, Monty Cook Games went public with their cipher system, and they had reached out to me asking me to be uh, one of the first adoptees of the cipher system open license, and would I have a pitch? Because they wanted to kind of come out of the gate with the announcement and things that were happening, other than just, ta-da, it's here, and, you know, crickets. Mm -hmm. So I made a cold email to the artist, Trevor Roberts, I was very upfront about my expectations, which actually had been far succeeded by the Kickstarter already. Um, Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. We are at 46,000 as we're speaking. And Monday, we're going to make a couple announcements, uh, including uh, if we can reach a 60,000 stretch goal, we're going to do another uh, role playing system mm -hmm. for the Mystery Flesh Pit because it shall not be contained by just one gaming system, though Cypher is. Uh, is my pride and joy uh, that I enjoy running and now designing for. And of course, the Monty, uh, Monty Cook Games crew are great, and uh, their community, the community for the game on the Discord, Cypher Unlimited, are a really great group of guys. So I feel like I really have a home with uh, using Cypher and being a Cypher player. And uh, But Trevor, he said yes. We made a deal. I sent uh, an email as the pitch to Charles Ryan of Monty Cook Games. And I am not exaggerating. His email said, today my son reminded me about the Mystery Flesh Pit and told me about how awesome he thought it would be a role-playing game idea. We are excited for your project. And uh, they've been great and supportive. And I, you know, like I said, it's sometimes it's about uh, being with the right people who support you mm -hmm. and help you out. So that's how that happened with the Mystery Flesh Pit. And the Cypher RPG. Yeah. Now, I do think it was an, I do think it was an interesting choice to go with Cypher. To you, what what um what about Cypher specifically made made it feel that this would be a natural fit for it? Well, Cypher actually has a, a history already of uh, being involved with like the horror genre. It has a genre book called Stay Alive. Mm -hmm. uh, the first game, Numenera, the first game using Cypher, Numenera, has some Lovecraftian elements that also kind of got moved over to their other Cypher flagship game, The Strange. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you go look at the Cypher primer, the adventure included in the primer is a horror adventure. So um, I did make some changes because with Cypher, if you play it at its default and you play everything in it, it can go very competent to very super heroic, especially towards the end. So I made some changes to kind of keep it more in the wheelhouse of what's going on with the Mystery Flesh Pit. Mm -hmm. So I'm ge I'm guessing that when it comes to when it comes to advancement, the the it's so, it's somewhat different. But how do you, how did you make sure to curtail that whole um, super heroic issue that can happen? Okay, so for with Cypher, um, not only do you have types, which are equivalent to classes and more analogous, you also have a theme you get, which is called a focus. Mm -hmm. And some people say, the game's not balanced because these focuses are all over the place. There's 70 focuses in the Cypher rulebook. Mm -hmm. If you look at the games that Monty Cook Games themselves make with Cypher, they only usually use 20 to 30 Cypher... Uh, thir 20 to 30 focuses at most. You're supposed to curate them. That's the balance is you don't really like look for a point value thing. You look at the focuses and go, yeah, I rather would be reading fits my campaign much better than rides the lightning or vice versa. And that's part of what I did is I picked, you know, the more mundane, the less um, power creepy uh, focuses. And in addition to that, um, I always say that 
Cypher can be like Dungeons and Dragons level 5 to 20 from their tiers of 1 to 6. And in this game, I only say you go to tier 3 and cap it there. Mm -hmm. And I felt vindicated because recently here, um, Mighty Cook Games put out First Responders, which is very much a 911 Chicago PD style game. They did the same. Mm. They kept the they kept the characters at tier three. I've done a couple of other things. They kind of just keep the levers on the uh, on the lower side, and so far, knock on wood, everybody feels like it's got it's kind of in that wheelhouse still. Yeah, and I can, I can see I can see that, and hell, even um, even the core book with the strange. For each of the worlds that that for each of the worlds that they focused on within the within the core book, um, there was a short list of kind of kind of suggestions when it came to focuses. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing for the Mystery Flesh Flesh Pit National Park RPG, which I'm gonna have to find a way to to shorten to shorten that because I'm not paid by the syllable. Um, <laughs> you have a you have a list of. Um, focuses from the cipher system that would be that would be suggestions and I'm guessing I'm guessing a few that are exclusive to the book correct uh, in fact one of the more exclusive things is a flavor uh, that a flavor can modify a type mm -hmm. to, especially if you want to make your type more into one genre or another and that flavor is PBSO manifestations Within the Mystery Flesh Pit universe, the name for the creature is the Permian Basin Superorganism. Mm -hmm. And manifestations, uh, you know, some people might call them mutations, might call them powers, but the only way to get those is to use that flavor. So there isn't a focus that gives you any sort of uh, supernatural powers. Yeah. And when it comes... When it comes to manifestations, do you have it on a on a list that can be randomly generated? Uh, I do not. Cipher kind of leans more towards people getting to pick what they want, uh, but also the catch is, like I can see, random is can be great because if you can't control what you get, that sometimes even things out. But um, meta PBSO manifestations also come with a level of corruption. You can only use those corruption points to fuel those powers, and it can change you later. So there's already kind of a, a heavy, you know, careful what you wish for. Uh, in addition to that, the powers, a lot of them come uh, with Cypher. Generally, when you have powers or you have um, gadgets, everything works. Uh, everything gives you a thing. These, a lot of them come with costs or potential mm -hmm. risks to use in the first place. So that's a little bit of your random element right there, <laughs> which I could I can cert I can certainly see that. Um, now you you mentioned you mentioned that there is a f that there is a few um, a few exclu a few exclusive focuses. What would be a few examples aside from um, that you could um, that you could tell me on that front? Uh, well, one is. And I apologize. It said focuses, but I meant more types. Mm. My bad. So those are more of the classes. The focuses, most of them will be familiar to most people. Mm. Uh, I did update one or two. Uh, like coming from noble birth sort of focus is that wouldn't work in a modern setting. Yeah. But the, the, cu the custom types I have, I have a PIB or a person in black, like a man in black. Mm -hmm. We've got a marketeer. We've got an engineer. And we have a park ranger, which is more like Texas Ranger. And when you're thinking about rangers in the Mystery Flesh Pit, you would think more of what we call a park guide. So that's where I kind of focused most of that uh, tweaking and customization on was on the types. Mm -hmm. And as from what you mentioned, it sounds like the are you having the types in the, in this case cap off at tier three? Everything caps off at tier three. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, um, what one of the other thing one of the other things that's listed on the Kickstarter that I think I think should be delved into a bit further is prototypes. Sure. And how Prototype. and how that uh, um, integrates into Cipher. 
So prototypes are the Mystery Flesh Pits version of ciphers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you were familiar with a game called Paranoia back in the day. Actually, I think it's still an active you're, game now. You're not cleared for that, citizen. Are you unhappy it, with your clearance? Exactly. <laughs> and in that vein, that's where prototypes come from. Also, an inspiration is uh, from like the Hellboy comic books and the Hellboy movies where, you know, the classic, this is something that's overly complicated and may or may not work. So, and just like I said earlier with the powers, ciphers in regular cipher, they do cool things and they just work. Here, um, you may be having some additional <laughs> issues of things melting or exploding uh, mm -hmm. on you as you try to use them. Yeah. And... One of the one of the I remember when the fir the first incarnation of the, of Cipher came out th that being Numenera, and one of the things that was really really hammered home and is still kind of the part of the DNA of of Cipher to this day is an emphasis on exploration, and I'm curious how that how that's going to be carried over into the Mystery Flesh Pit RPG because well, the... go ahead. Okay. Because one, because obviously one one aspect that's mentioned is expo is exploring it for various reasons. Well, we have uh, three frameworks mm -hmm. we're going to deal with with the mystery flesh pit, and those three frameworks. Uh, one is called uh, public service, where you are park employees, uh, so that's going to have some of the exploration in there. Uh, then we have um, the private contractors, which would be more where your people in black are coming from as you veil out incidents that happen. And then we have the special contingency framework where you are fugitives on the run. And actually the artist, uh, Trevor, actually he, he likes that one the most, which is also intriguing because, you know, there are no records of anybody having any sort of powers in the mystery flesh pit. Mm-hmm. So uh, we get those points for there. Also, the game changes up two of those frameworks because it's not just about public service, but you, uh, you know, you're spending all your time in this living creature. There's no sharp corners. There's no straight lines. You go back to your cubicle at the end of the day, and, oh, my God, your Post-it notes, if you could just color code them and just put them in the right corner, you know, evened up right with the edge of your desk, that would be so great. Instead of sanity, we have something called conformity, which is you know kind of an obsession with bureaucracy and organization. And I I did notice so, in the I there was one little gag that I could I couldn't help but notice when it came to the three adventures thing listed on the Kickstarter, and that is everything eventually goes down to paperwork. Exactly. If you've read the Laundry Files from Charles Strauss, which if you mm -hmm. haven't, you should. I have, uh, and I've I have the RPG version in my library. Excellent, excellent. But yeah, and that also that same vein of bureaucrat. You're doing some bureaucratic satire with those uh, with the two first frameworks to just kind of amp, amp up the tension and a little bit of the silliness as well. So, you know, humor is a part of horror if it's properly timed, mm -hmm. and this is goes right back into that. Yeah. Um. When you meant so there'll be some exploration, but mm -hmm. there's also some additional things that are going on for you to earn your grit and your mm -hmm. XP. And um, when you mentioned humor mixing with horror, um, I, unsurprisingly, one of the first things that came to mind to me was um, Evil Dead. If only because e Evil Dead is kind is kind of doing that, but doing it in a fun in a funhouse kind of way. Uh, and. I can see that particular angle being used with the mystery flesh pit, especially with how how some of the brochures on the on the site are are written out. You know, with the with these horrible monstrosities being ri being written out like they were just in the same way you would write about warnings about natural wildlife. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which I think it's part of the I think it's part of the appeal, honestly. Oh yeah, de definitely. So, given that given that the prototypes are the are the ciphers, um, what would be? What, could you give me a few examples on on some of the prototypes that are going to be in the book? Sure, give me just a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's 
is the potential for what ciphers can be is limitless so it's one of those things I, f I figure is Im is important to ask oh no problem uh, and I'm assuming we're not live right <laughs> no I can I can take care of it Sure. So as some examples, we've got the ultraviolet goggles that give you low level, low level. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> Three, two, one. Sure. I've got a couple of examples. Uh, we have ultraviolet goggles. Uh, they have tiny needles that line the inside of the lenses that, you know, kind of latch into your skin when you put the goggles on. Mm. It will give you a, a give you specialized and low light level spotting, but uh, you could get permanently impaired with your uh, vision. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the nerve enhancer, which um, can give you a free level of effort, but you're going to probably feel like you have a hangover the next day mm -hmm. when you're done. And uh, the shelter cyst, which, you know, when you're within the mystery flesh pit, uh, becomes a kind of organic tent. Uh, and could actually go from being temporary to being permanent if you uh, have it inside the PBSO. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of these, like I said, um, think of your typical cipher and then uh, think about how it could be just worse <laughs> to your health. And that is how what a lot of prototypes are like. Mm -hmm. So I've, would it be fair to say that if not all of them, the majority of the prototypes have some kind of catch? Uh, yeah, a good chunk of them. I You can't just, you know, as with uh, writing something, if you do the same thing over and over, it kind of loses its punch. So there are some that, you know, let you, quote unquote, get away with like having just a normal experience. But there's quite a few that will give you a negative to it. That's mm -hmm. part of the challenge with writing this is with Trevor, <clears throat> he has ridiculous graphic, you know, photo of some sort or, or and then he has these very droll sort of punchline text to go with it. I can't do that for every item and everything. So there's a fine kind of needle to thread there between doing slapstick and being too droll. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the one of the big GM facing mechanics within Cipher has always been GM intrusions. Mm -hmm. Um. And given how that's given how that kind of thing is a bit of a blank check in in campaigns, um, are you planning on putting a few examples on what on what would be good suggestions for intrusions for a GM? Oh, indeed, uh, I especially have to because I have a uh, I've taken the void mode or horror mode and turned it into the spiral mode mm -hmm. and put that on steroids. So what, so what do you mean by that? Uh, basically, for an example, with like horror mode, if you go into a spooky house, horror mode can be activated by the GM. Mm -hmm. uh, I give the GM a lot more reasons to activate spiral mode, including using their PBSO manifestations. So uh, one of the things I thought with like corruption mechanics is in a lot of games for me, corruption mechanics, either the corruption is so slow, uh, it never happens within the playable time that you're doing uh your game or it happens really quick and you know you're on to your second character there isn't a way to kind of put a lever to control it hmm. and in spiral mode was a great way to do that like when it really matters now the tension's on you could end up getting more corruption hmm. if you know and then when spiral mode is off well then you still could risk it but it's not going to be as uh, quickly as it would be when the stress is high and things are crazy now, with corruption, is it a, is it a case of a counting up kind of re, kind of resource? Uh, yeah, you get more points, uh, and then at a certain point, you may test against those points, uh, and you can a GM can customize what dice he uses to test against those points. And if the uh, PC loses, well, then they start getting uh, deficits to them, and too many deficits, and they become an NPC. Mm -hmm. And I'm paraphrasing just to make it quicker. Yeah, obviously there's going to be a whole lot, a whole lot more involvement. But oh, I even have a way for people to like get rid of their corruption and kind of just you know kind of purify themselves if mm -hmm. they wish. 
But once you've chosen to go down that path, there's always going to be some corruption hanging in the background. Yeah. Um, is is I've seen I've seen some cases where you have a corruption mechanic or something similar where it's easy to get it at the start, but it gets significantly harder to get it um, late later on. Is it? Are you going down that particular route, or is it, or is it? It's always it's always relatively easy to get it if you're not careful. Uh, it depends on on how you know uh, your GM intrusions happen, and in Mystery Flesh Pit, one of the small tweaks that has bigger ramifications is that you cannot use your grit to re-roll uh, your your ones and your GM intrusions. You're stuck with them once you get them. You can re-roll other you know failed rolls, but if it's a GM intrusion, you're you're going to have to uh, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And then it, it just lets you know, I keep mentioning grit. Usually that would be XP in a standard Cypher game. Mm -hmm. I've split those two out. Just do XP for advancements and grit for the in-game bonuses. Uh, you would use your XP in a standard Cypher game. Yeah, that makes sense. Now... You had mentioned earlier that you were tweaking about with types, and I'd like to dive a little bit fur further into that, since the core the core four types are warrior, adept, explorer, and speaker. Mm -hmm. And is it a, what I'd like to ask first is what is um which one of those is, which one of those would be the would be the equivalent of what they are in uh, mystery flesh pit, starting with warrior. Give me just a moment, because mm -hmm. I can pull things up. Warrior, uh, the closest thing to warrior would be the security type. Mm -hmm. And there's also the park ranger. Yeah. Uh, the park ranger, they focus uh, a little bit more about being inside the creature. Um, and security has a little bit more of a police detective vibe. Just kind of depending on how you put things together. Mm -hmm. uh, next on the list would be adept. Well, I don't really have a straight up adept. Um, a if... perfect example example: some of the PBSO manifestation flavors mm -hmm. come from uh, the adept type. Uh, it's more uh, engineer and part guide. Uh, some of them combine a little bit of adept. Some of them combine a little bit more of the explorer. All right. And speaking of that, ex um, the explorer. Uh, that would be that would be the part guide, though he mm -hmm. does focus on a little more on vehicles and first aid, mm -hmm. versus the engineer who focuses on just straight up fixing things. Yeah. And lastly, of the main four, the speaker. So field marketing would be uh, close to the speaker. Mm -hmm. And there are more of the corporate types hanging in the background and uh, trying to smooth things out. And then the other speaker would be the PIB. Yeah. Now, are there any, um, are there any new, any new um, drawbacks that you, that you plan on putting into the book? Uh, you mean... You know that it is an unexplored section of Cypher. People don't really play around with drawbacks that much. I kind of put my drawbacks within the different systems, like mm -hmm. the prototypes and uh, the PBO manifestations versus using actual drawbacks. All right, that's that is that is a uh, fair that is a fair thing to do. Oh. Probably the yeah. thing I have not changed the most. Uh, the probably the thing I've changed the least would be descriptors, which makes sense. The descriptor as it is is already pretty comprehensive, and the the only thing I could see I could see I could see changing is just re is just reskinning some of them that are that are already there, which I'm guessing is what you ended up doing with some of them. Correct. Oh. Probably organizational wise, I took the generic flavors and I put them more back into uh, the GMing section because GMs are supposed to authorize your flavors anyway. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was um, sometimes I've noticed some players, if, if it's in the player section, 
even if it says GM approval is needed, they kind of take a shopping list approach to things. Yeah, uh, can work in, can work in some cases, but only to a point. Now, as I now as I understand it, you um what. I think one of these stretch goals that you had already that I think you've already met was the I nine Adventure trilogy. Yep, we did. Mm -hmm. and, and those are going to be each each of those adventures is going to be expanding on one of the frameworks. Uh, you know, to give a full on adventure mm -hmm. versus a mini adventure, and you know, uh, Ken Height, who's a really awesome game designer and uh if there's another podcast you should be listening to uh ken and robin talk about stuff should definitely be on the list mm -hmm. and one of the bits of advice he gave in his podcast was sometimes you have a really great idea and it's too great uh you can do a dozen things with it and you have to just stay focused so i narrowed it down to like three frameworks and uh you know general kind of time frames those frameworks would work best in mm-hmm uh, but yeah, we'll probably be expanding on. Yes, we talked about public service, but we didn't really talk about the corporate half or being on the being on the the white collar job side of mm -hmm. working for Anodyne. Yeah. So uh, you know, but you know, the best thing to do when you're trying to give people an idea because I've seen some really awesome settings to play in, but by the time they're done telling you the setting, and because they've you know every good commercial setting tries to tries to cast a net and get the most people possible and get the most genres as possible but when they're done you're like great what is i what do i do with this as a gm how do what's what's the campaign i'm looking for what's the you know what's the two ele two minute elevator pitch i can say not only is this an awesome world but what we're doing so that's with the three frameworks that's the the big thing i i'm hoping to help people do is you know, these are three easy, you know, straightforward things to start up. And then with the I-9, oh, this is how I can take that framework and address another, you know, something of a similar vein, but with a new spin on it. Yeah. When you, when you mentioned, um, when you mentioned that whole thing with, with settings, one of the first, one of the first ones that came to mind for me was the numerous times I've had trouble, I've had trouble doing a full on tabletop campaign with Battletech. Just because, just because of of the issue of where of where do I put where do I put people in since it's it wants to do this year by year detail, which works great for a war game, not so much for a role playing game setting. And everybody says, yeah. "We'll just make them all mercenaries." That doesn't quite cut it. BattleTech is one of the trickier ones. Uh, the people I think that have had fun with it. Uh, generally, just you know, instead of going year by year, they just they just pick an era and they pick a house, and they they go with that versus mm -hmm. doing the mercenary things. And a lot of them I see they do the role playing, but really it's also just kind of second fiddle to doing the um, doing the cool board game with it. Which... Uh, I I hang out with some friends. They do BattleTech every Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more of an Alpha Strike guy myself. Yeah, and. Uh, and I ha I happen to be the that one that I was always that one weirdo who who um this who, while everybody was trying to do range combat his mindset was you know, let, let's just throw in a bunch of chargers and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that brought me back to BattleTech was watching uh, some guys play a game, mm -hmm. and back when I was playing it, if you weren't running a whole lance, you were being a wimp, mm -hmm. and that that whole meta has changed where it's just one one guy, one mech. Um, and uh, even then, I, I know what you're saying. I I joined them, and I still picked two mechs. One was an archer, and the other one was a was a uh, hatchet man. Mm -hmm. That way, when the hatchet man was done, I'd still be in the game. Yeah. <laughs> but with with all of that in, with all of that in mind, oh, I am cur I'm curious if. You, if you have plans on putting anything like an event table re regarding the exploration of the pit, since there's so much, there's so much potentially that you can do with it. We're going to be putting in, yeah, some some tables to help with exploring and give GMs ideas because there's just a lot of things that could be, you can just get lost in for days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really great to have a resource like the website 
especially for uh, using for visual references and visual aids. But uh, we have to provide at least enough lore people feel comfortable running the game without having to go dig back to the website. Yeah, analysis paralysis is still a thing. But what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Um, we are, you know, we're waiting to see what the final budget is, but I, I give, definitely guarantee you it's going to be over 200 pages. Mm -hmm. At least. Which... Could be bigger, but also um, that's the beauty that we have PDF stretch goals because what we can't fit in the book we can turn into an, a PDF stretch goal bonus mm -hmm. and send that to the, our players as well. Oh, yeah, And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Thank you. Yep. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, the beverages were great. I'll, I'll have to get one of them on the way out. <laughs> Everybody's always aghast at the idea that monks drink. I don't... Not as... Depends on which monks you're talking about. <laughs> Well, some of them brew their own beer. Exactly. But, and and of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to talk, whether it's to talk about the mystery flesh pit or an, or any of your other projects, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>